for inviting us and uh, have us come here and speak to you uh, about our religion and our way of life that we are uh, so proud of, uh, as, as you are of yours. And that shows a, a spirit of uh, tolerance uh, from, from your side and, and in your community and your congregation and uh, a spirit of acceptance, which we, we really appreciate. Uh, and uh, we ask the Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, to make this uh, gathering fruitful and make it uh, a beginning for uh, a lot of friendships and uh, uh, to uh, expand that, that spirit of tolerance and, and uh, even more, more and more. Uh, before I give you the details about Islam, which is the reason for my visit, uh, I'd like to share a story with you first. This story has been taught to us, especially the ones that were uh, uh, born and raised as Muslims, not uh, the ones that uh, we've heard in Islam, just like our brother Todd here. Uh, uh, we were taught this story from childhood. Uh, it is a story of a, a noble and a righteous woman, uh, a role model for uh, all the other women, uh, a woman that our beloved prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mentioned uh, as, as being the, the best woman of all mankind. Her name in Arabic and Hebrew is Maryam, and uh, her name in, uh, in English is Mary, or the Virgin Mary. But I will not tell you the story uh, from my own words, rather I will, tell, I will recite it from uh, the, way, and the way it was revealed to our prophet, uh, and in turn to all of us, over 1400 years ago in the original language of uh, Revelation, of, of our book, from chapter 19 uh, of the Quran. I will recite and I will translate, inshallah. So bear with me, inshallah. Uh, by the way, this chapter that I will quote from, from and recite from is chapter 19 and is entitled Maryam, which is Mary. It is the whole chapter entitled Mary. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واذكر في الكتاب مريم إذ انتبدت من أهلها مكانا شوقيا فاتخذت من دونهم حجابا فأرسلنا إليها روحنا فتمثل لها بشرا سويا قالت إني أعوذ بالرحمن منك إن كنت تقيا قال إنما أنا رسول ربك لأهب لك غلاما زكيا قالت أنا يكون لي غلام ولم يمسسني بشر ولم أك بغيا قال كذلك قال ربك هو علي هين ولنجعله آية للناس ورحمة وكان أمرا مقضيا Translation or mention, mention O Muhammad to the people in the book the story of Mary when she withdrew from her family to a place towards the east and she took in seclusion from them and a screen. Then we sent to her our angel, or our spirit, who was the angel Gabriel. And he represented her, himself to her as a well-proportioned, good-looking man. She said, indeed, I seek refuge in the most merciful, who is the creator, from you. So leave me if you should be fearing of Allah or God. He said, I am the messenger of your Lord to give you the news of a pure boy. She said, how can I have a boy while no man has ever touched me and I have not been unchaste? He said, thus it will be, your Lord says, it is easy for me and I will make him a sign for the people and a mercy from us and it was a matter already decreed. He goes on to say, فَحَمَلَتْهُ فَانْتَبَدَتْ بِهِ مَكَانًا قَصِيًّا فَأَجَاءَهَا الْمَخَاضُ إِلَى جِذْعِ النَّخْلَةِ 
قالت يا ليتني مت قبل هذا وكنت نسيا منسيا فناداها من تحتها ألا تحزني قد جعل ربك تحتك سريا وهزي إليك بجذع النخلة تساقط عليك رطبا جنيا فكلي واشربي وقضي عينا فإما ترين من البشر أحدا فقولي فقولي إني نذرت للرحمن صوما فلن أكلم اليوم إنسيا Translation so she conceived him and you know who he is baby Jesus peace be upon him and she would draw with him to a remote place and the pain of childbirth drove her to a trunk of a palm tree she said oh I wish I had died before this and I was in oblivion forgotten but he called her from below her do not grieve your Lord has provided beneath you a stream and shake towards you the trunk of the palm tree he will drop upon you ripe fresh dates so eat and drink and be content and if you see from amongst humanity anyone say indeed I have vowed abstention to the most beneficent the most merciful so I will speak today to I would not speak today to any man he goes on to say فأتت بقومها تحمله قالوا يا مريم لقد جئت شيئا فريا يا أخت هارون ما كان أبوك امرأ سوء وما كانت أمك بغيا فأشارت إليه قالوا كيف نكلم من كان في المهد صبيا قال إني عبد الله آتاني الكتاب وجعلني نبيا وجعلني مباركا أينما كنت وأوصاني وأوصاني بالصلاة والزكاة ما دمت حيا وبرا بوالدتي ولم يجعلني جبارا شقيا والسلام علي يوم أولدت ويوم أموت ويوم أبعث حيا Translation Then she brought him to her people carrying him They said, O oh Mary, you have certainly done a thing unprecedented O oh sister of Aaron Your father was not a man of evil nor was your mother unchaste So she pointed to him They said, how can we speak to one that is in the cradle, a child. Jesus, peace be upon him, said, Indeed, I am the servant of the Almighty. I have, he has given me the scripture and made me a prophet, and he has made me blessed wherever I am, and joined upon me prayer and charity as long as I remain alive. And he made me dutiful to my mother, and he has not made me a wretched tyrant. And peace is on me the day that I was born, the day that I will die, and the day that I'm raised alive. This is in chapter 19 from the Quran, uh, from 16 to 33. The story of Jesus, peace be upon him. And it's the story of his mother and, and his birth in general. Uh, and he is mentioned also in a lot of different uh, areas of the Quran that I will mention to you. Chapter 3, which is the second, second longest chapter in the Quran, has 26 pages. It is entitled, Ali Imran. The family of Imran. Who can tell me who Imran is? Imran is the father of the Virgin Mary. Yeah, that's Imran. In Ali Imran, the Almighty says, Inna Allah astafa Adam wa Nuhan wa ala Ibrahim wa ala Imran ala al-alameen. Allah 
فتقبل مني إنك أنت السميع العليم فلما وضعتها قالت رب إني وضعتها أنثى والله أعلم بما وضعت وليس الذكر كالأنثى وإني سميتها مريم وإني أعيذها بك وذليتها من الشيطان الرجيم فتقبلها ربها بقبول حسن وأنبتها وأنبتها نباتا حسنا وكفلها زكريا كلما دخل عليها زكريا المحراب وجد عندها رزقا قال يا مريم أنا لك هذا قالت هو من عند الله إن الله يرزق من يشاء بغير حساب Translation Indeed, Allah, or God, chose Adam and Noah and the family of Abraham and the family of Imran, who I, who I mentioned, over the world, descendants, some of them from the others. And Allah, or God, is hearing and knowing. Then he says, mention, O Muhammad, when the wife of Imran said, My Lord, indeed I have pledged to you what I have in my womb, cons consecrated, <coughs> For your service, for the service of the house of God. So accept from me, O oh God, accept from me. <coughs> Indeed, you are the hearing and knowing. But when she delivered her, she said, My Lord, I have delivered a female. And this, by the way, because in the time of the Israelites, only males were <coughs> consecrated for the service of the house. She said, I delivered a female. And Allah is most knowing of what I delivered. And the male is not like the female in that sense that I spoke about. And I have named her Maryam, Mary, and I seek refuge for her in you from, and her, and her descendants from Satan, the accursed one. So her, her Lord accepted her with good, good acceptance and caused her to grow in good manner. And he put her in the care of Zechariah. Who's Zechariah? Well, he was the priest. Well, he's actually a prophet. And he's the, the father of John, John the Baptist, who we call Yahya in Arabic. And he was also the husband, the husband of her aunt, of Hannah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Every time Zechariah entered upon her in the prayer chamber, he found her with provision, sustenance. It was said that he will come in the winter, for example, and he will find fruits of the summer. And in the summer, you will find fruits of the winter, which is, and for us, it's normal. We have refrigerators and freezers. But back then, it was the strangest. It's amazing. It's a, it's a miracle. He said, well, Ma Mary, Maryam, where do you get this from? She said, it is from Allah, from God, the Almighty, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, she says, indeed, Allah, or God, provides for whom he wills without any, any, any accountability. A few verses down in this particular chapter, the Almighty says, uh, do you want me to keep reciting or just translate? Which one? <coughs> just translate. Translate? Okay, because that's what we... <laughs> it's been wonderful listening. Yeah. Yeah. So, show of hands, recite or just translate? <laughs> recite. We like what you did earlier, that we can help you put a perspective for us. I think maybe the translation might be... Okay, no problem. Can I say something very small? He's reciting in Arabic. Yes. Arabic is very close to Aramaic, which was the language that Jesus spoke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you could be listening if, to someone in the time of Jesus speaking, and he would sound like that. Exactly. Yeah. If he was here, he would, he would understand everything that I'm saying. So <coughs> recite. All right, recite. Yeah. One more, one more, one more time. Yeah. وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَاكِ وَطَهَّرَكِ وَاصْطَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ يَا مَرْيَمُ قُنُتِي لِرَبِّكِ وَاسْجُدِي وَارْكَعِي مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ 
ذلك من أنباء الغيب نوحيه إليك وما كنت لديهم إذ يلقون أقلامهم أيهم يكفل مريم وما كنت لديهم إذ يختصمون إذ قالت الملائكة إذ قالت الملائكة يا مريم إن الله يبشرك بكلمة يبشرك بكلمة من اسمه المسيح عيسى بن مريم وجيها في الدنيا والآخرة ومن المقربين ويكلم الناس في المهد وكهلا ومن الصالحين Translation and mention O Muhammad to the people when the angel said O Mary indeed Allah or God has chosen you and purified you and chosen you above all of the women of the world. O Mary, be devoutly obedient to your Lord and prostrate and bow with those who bow in prayer. That is from the news that he's telling his prophet, Prophet Muhammad. That is from the news of the unseen which will reveal to you, O Muhammad. And you were not with them when they <coughs> cast their pens to as to which one of them would be responsible for Mary. I'll explain that real quick. When she was born, her father had already, had already passed away. So, and she was the, the, the daughter of very righteous people. So they were people competing over her care. Who's going to take care of her? So they threw their pens in, in a river, and they said whoever uh, whose pen is going to uh, swim upstream is the one that's going to take care of her. And it was the pen of Zechariah, the, the prophet, who's who is uh, supposed to take care of her. So, uh, uh, then uh, he's telling his prophet, his, his messenger Muhammad, peace be upon him, that you were not there when they were casting their, their pens as to which one of them should be responsible for Mary, nor were you there when they had their dispute. And mention that the angel said, O oh Mary, indeed Allah gives you, O oh God gives you, the good tidings, the glad tidings of a word from him, whose name will be the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, distinguished in this world and in the hereafter and among the, those who were brought near, near to the Almighty. So this is the way that Islam praises the righteous people of the past. And this is the status that they have in the eyes of, of Muslims. You would not be a Muslim, a true Muslim, if you don't believe uh, 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 in these people, these prophets and messengers and righteous people of the past. You, that your Islam will not be complete, it will be lacking. And since I'm here to explain what Islam is, I will start uh, by explaining some words and ideas and actions that are usually a subject of misunderstanding and misconception. The first one, a word that you he heard me use a lot already, Allah. Where does that come from? I mean, you guys say God. People of Hispanic descent say Dios. The French say Dieu. Uh, uh, Italians say Dio, and so on and so forth. But Arabic speaking people say Allah. Why? First of all, the Arabs are from the Semites, Semitic descent. As a matter of fact, the Arabs are the very first Semites that emerged. The very first tribe that descended from Sam, the son of Noah, are the, uh, the, these the very first tribe of, of Arabs uh, with the prophet Hebert that you have in the Bible, in the Arabic language, his name is Hud. And actually I named one of my children after him, Prophet Hud, peace be upon him. Uh, they're, the, they're the very first people that spoke the Arabic language. And the Semites in majority, uh, there are many of the Semites, but uh, most people think it's just the Hebrews or the Jews, but there are many of them, like for example, the Arabs, the Hebrews, the Phoenicians, the Akkadians, the, uh, the, 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 the Can Canaanites, uh, uh, the Philistines, the uh, Abyssinians as well, people that are in Ethiopia today, as well as the ones that spoke Syriac and Aramaic, like Jesus, peace be upon him. And now, how did uh, the Semites, in general, refer to the Almighty, the one that they worship, the one that, they, that created the heavens and the earth? And I'll give you a few words. Some of them say Ilah, some of, some of them say Ilah, the Hebrews, for example, say Elohim. Some say Aloho, or Alaho, or Ilaha, or Allahi, 
or Jesus, peace be upon him, that spoke mm -hmm. Arabic, he said, Eloi, for my Lord, and he said, Allah, for God. And that's why, uh, uh, as, as Muslims, we say, Ilahi, you say Eloi, Ilahi, see how close they are? Ilahi, for our Lord, my Lord, and we say Allah, for God. Same thing. So it's very similar to the way that Jesus used to say it. He says Eloi, we say Ilahi. He says Allah, we say Allah. So it's very similar. That's why when you hear the word Allah, don't think of some, because I've, I've seen some books that were propagated. They talk about some moon god <coughs> and a, that, uh, that it lives in a black box in a desert or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we have to kiss the, the ground five times a day. I've heard that. Sir, that can kind you of spell stuff. that? How are you well, in, uh, in, in English, uh, either I-L-L-A-H or okay. I-L-A-H. Okay. Yeah. So you Ilah. pronounce it with the E, it comes, but it's... It, okay. comes from, it comes from two words. The Ila in Arabic is any deity. Any deity qualifies to be called Ila. Uh, Aliha, this also comes from the same root word, it means to worship. Aliha is to worship. Okay? So this, this, okay. that's why these, these are connected. So the word... But the word Allah, we use the word Allah because it's the proper way, the most proper way of calling upon the Almighty, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, because it is perfect in the linguistically, and this you can ask the linguists that are professionals in this, it is genderless, you cannot make male or female, and it cannot make in, be made into plural. And, and it has monotheism in it, built in it, meaning that the word Allah it means the only one worthy of worship. That's, it, that's what it means. The only one worthy of worship. And furthermore, if you were to go to Egypt, for example, and we have someone here uh, that's from Egypt. Uh, and in Egypt, there, there are Christians in Egypt, the Coptic uh, 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 Christians. Uh, and if you open their Bible, their Bible is similar to your Bible. It just translated and it's in Arabic. Wherever you're going to find God, in your Bible, you will find what? Allah. There you go. Allah in their Bible. It's in the, in the same spot. So I hope that clears uh, that, that misconception. Now, the word Islam. Uh, uh, what is Islam? Is it the name of a people, of a group of people? Is it a denomination of a particular community uh, from an area of the world? That's what a lot of people tend to think. But rather, it is an action. Islam is an action. It means to obey, submit, adhere, and surrender your will to the will of the one that created you in order to attain peace with him, peace with yourself, and peace with your surrounding. See how the, deep the Arabic language is? One word, it took all of that to really <laughs> bring you close to the meaning. I'll give you a, a story how deep the Arabic language is. Back in the Arabs of what we call Jahiliyyah, before the coming of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were people, of, they were pagans. They used to worship idols. Uh, but they, their strength was their eloquence in the, this language, this very deep language, uh, and their command of this language. There was a man that loved a woman and wanted to marry her. But he went to, when he went to her father to ask for her hand in marriage, father didn't like him that much, he just... He wanted to tell him, you know, in a nice way, go fish or any other <laughs> way. He had lost. He says, you know, no problem. Yes, absolutely. But, you know, there is a, a big lion that threatens our livestock. I want you to go and take care of him. And bring me his head. That's her dowry. If you do that, you can marry her. He says, okay. He got on his horse with his spear, went and found the lion. He fought the lion and he brought his head. To the man, he said, okay, here we go. So the man could not say anything, so they got married. And it was customary that they stood, that the groom would stand and give a speech on the day of his wedding. But it's not like uh, us here, we're going to do half an hour, 45 minutes. The man stood from morning to sunset speaking. And he was speaking, and people were sitting. Do you know why? Because he was speaking in poetry, all in rhymes, in perfect poetry. And he was describing his battle with the lion and he mentioned the word lion 400 times but only he mentioned the lion every time with a different name 
That means the Arabic language has over 400 names of the line alone. And most of us here know probably five or six or seven, but we don't know this is, that list of 400 is, is huge. That's how deep this language is, and that's why the Almighty cho chose it for the last uh, revelation. So, uh, uh, Islam, like I said, is to, what did I say? To obey, submit, adhere, surrender your will to the will of the one that created you so that may, you may attain peace with him, which is important, with yourself and with your surrounding. So based on that, based on that definition that I gave you, we believe uh, that all the prophets and messengers of the past, they practiced exactly that action. It had, they had a na different name for it, they had a different name for it, but that's exactly what they practiced. They practiced Islam, which is to submit and to adhere uh, and to surrender their will to the will of the one that created them. Now, the English language, in the English language we used the suffix er at the end uh, for someone that does an action in a uh, continuous or repetitive way. So we say someone that walks a lot, a walker, right? Someone that travels a lot, a traveler. Someone that believes, a believer, right? In the Arabic language is the, the prefix mu, we say mu. So someone who travels, we say to travel is safara. Safara is to travel. By the way, the word safari comes from the Arabic word safara. So we say mu safir, someone who travels a lot. Uh, uh, someone who believes, to believe is amana, amana. Someone who believes, we say mu, mu iman or mu min. Mu min is one that believes. So someone who practices. Islam as an action, we say Mu Islam, we put them together, that's Mu Slim, that's the word Muslim. And it's not Muslim, as a lot of people pronounce it, because the ones that propagated this word Muslim, they actually did it on purpose to give it a negative connotation, and it was the or mostly the Orientalists. I don't know if you guys know who the Orientalists are. Orientalists are a group of people all throughout history that travel to the East to study Islam, in order to harm Islam and Muslims. That's what, that was the purpose of their study. And they propagated this word Muslim because it has to do with dhulm. And dhulm is oppression or darkness. It's something completely different. It's not, it's the action, this action is completely different. So it's not Muslim or Islam. It is Muslim or Islam. Uh, number three, I'm sure this, is one in, this one is uh, in the, the minds of all of, all of you. Uh, why do Muslim women cover? cover their hair and cover themselves. Why? Uh, why do they, uh, and why do a Muslim men wear these long things? When well, someone told me once, why are you wearing a dress? Why? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we have trousers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, careful now. <laughs> so, why do we wear these long things when we have beards? Why? So first of all, the Almighty created men and women and He made them physically different. They're different from each other physically, and so they and the purpose of that so they can complete each other. Each one of them has what the other needs, so they complete each other. And he gave each one of them points of attraction, physical attributes that make them attractive to one another. We all know this. But when making uh, uh, making uh, this amazing creation that is called the woman, he endowed her with a lot more of those attributes, the points. Of attraction and he has made it so that only the man who is worthy of her the man that steps up to the plate as you guys say the one that vows to cherish her and love her and the one that vows to care for her for the rest of her life gets to look at those points of attraction he is the only one that gets to appreciate those uh, uh, points of attraction he's the only one that gets to enjoy those points of attraction when they are united in marriage. And as for the men that want to just play, play around, the head covering says to them, I will not be an object of your lust. I will not be a subject of your desires. I will not be the one, one to play with, one to be toyed with. I am a serious, devout, religious woman, so stay away. That's basically what the covering spells. So women in Islam are, uh, uh, like uh, I'll give you an example, a very expensive jewel. When you go to a jewelry store, you have the regular items, the ones that everyone gets to see, maybe gets to touch, 
and gets a try on. But the real items, the expensive ones, the ones that cost thousands of dollars, maybe millions, are the ones that usually are hidden in the vault. They are meticulously covered up and, 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 and wrapped up. And only the ones, only the ones that are ready to buy and get to see them briefly, only the ones that are ready to pay the price, the right price, are the, are the ones that get to, to see them. Now, uh, this is just an example. Um, this is uh, for you to visualize what I'm talking about. I'm not suggesting that women should be compared to any kind of object. Uh, quite the contrary. Apart from that, we're, I'm just trying to show you that women in Islamic society, they're, they are of very high value. They're of tremendous importance in uh, uh, Muslim society. So the covering uh, uh, of the attractive feature of a woman in Islam is made so that she is not a temptation for men. And Muslim women, they follow the footsteps of uh, uh, all the women of God all throughout history, especially uh, the most righteous woman that ever lived, the one that I mentioned at the beginning. They dress modestly and they cover their beauty as did the Virgin Mary. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon her. Now men, they grow their beards and their beards and they, uh, they, uh, uh, they dress in modest, and long and non-form-fitting clothes as a part of their natural disposition. It is uh, uh, very similar to the head covering for women. It is designed to suppress some of the men's beauty so that they're not a source of temptation for the women as well. And wearing a, a, a long and non-form-fitting garment as well as growing the beard, and you all know this, have been the way of men of God all throughout history. Wherever you think of a depiction of Jesus, peace be upon him, what do you think of? Someone that is dressed like me, exactly, and someone that has a long beard. So it has been the way of men of God all throughout history. Now, which brings us to a word that you hear a lot in the media, and sometimes, and I, I, have a, uh, I happen to have a radio show, I have a radio show every Thursday, and I spoke about this a lot. Whenever this, this word is mentioned, it's like people get the chills down their spine, and that word is Sharia. You heard that before? Oh, Sharia law is coming to get us. I've heard that before. Okay. The word Sharia, what does it mean? If I asked you to translate the word Torah, or Torah, from Hebrew to English, what would you say? What does the Torah mean? As a word, as a meaning. Somebody said that. I heard someone say that. The law. Exactly. Now, if I, wanted, if I asked you to translate the word Torah into the Arabic language, what would you say? Exactly. Yeah. There you go. See? Torah in Arabic is Sharia. She gets an A. She gets an A. <laughs> a plus. So Torah in the Hebrew language is Sharia. That's how we pronounce it. Sharia in the Arabic language. Then Sharia in a Muslim country. In a Muslim country. This is very important. It means the laws, the rules, the regulations that govern the people. In other words, what we call here the law of the land. That's what Sharia means. That being said, can you possibly imagine a country or a land without any laws? Can you? No. It would be complete, it would be complete chaos, right? Uh, I am one of those people that, uh, and I try to teach that to my kids as well, that when I see police officers patrolling the streets, I say, thank God. Or is it thank Allah? There you go. I say, thank Allah. So you guys have been following. I say, thank, thank Allah for these officers that keep us safe. And they regulate the traffic so that people don't run us over and so we don't have chaos. So basically they follow the sharia of this land, the laws of this land. So uh, uh, the sharia, that's what it does. And not only that, the sharia regulates, as Muslims, it regulates our creed, our worship, and our dealings with the others. So when you worship the Almighty alone without any partners with him, that is from Sharia. When you follow the footsteps of all the prophets and messengers from Noah to Abraham to Moses to Jesus and all the others and Muhammad peace be upon all of them, that is from Sharia. When you are kind to your wife or to your husband and you, uh, you work hard to make them happy, to fulfill their needs and to be faithful to them, that is from Sharia. When you do your best at school and at work to fulfill your responsibility and be honest, that is 
from Sharia. When you work on yourself to pre prevent yourself from lying and cheating and being deceitful and in your dealings with people, that is from Sharia. When you guard your chastity and stay away from fornication until you get married, that is from Sharia. When you are kind to your neighbors, regardless of their race, their religion, their origin, and their skin color, that is from Sharia. When you respect the beliefs of uh, and, and the, the, the religious practices of the other person, the, even if they're different from yours, or they're even opposite of yours, that is from Sharia. When you are dutiful to your parents, may Allah, I ask the Almighty to make me dutiful to my mother, because my father passed away uh, over 12 years ago. I only have my mother as, as my pride and joy. May Allah make me dutiful to her. So when you're dutiful to your parents, and you treat them with respect, and take care of them, when they're older and they're weaker and they need you, that is from Sharia. <coughs> when you help someone in need, comfort them and support them and make them make life easier for them, that is from Sharia. When you love for the others what you love for yourself, that is from Sharia. There is a hadith of Prophet Muhammad because there's a separation when it comes to our literature from between Quran and Sunnah. Quran is the words of God or Allah as they were revealed to Prophet Muhammad he recited exactly the way that he heard them unchanged and by the way anyone can make this experiment go to any place on the on the, the face of this earth and look for a Quran you will find it exactly identical to the other one that you'll find there they're all identical okay so and there's Sunnah which are the teachings and the sayings and the behaviors and the actions of our Prophet peace be upon him they're in a separate book that tells exactly how he lived his life so we can follow suit. So he said, one of you would not believe, would not truly be a believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And I personally feel this is a golden rule that we, if we live, if we live by this rule, if we live by this rule, this world will be a much better place. And unfortunately, everyone wants for himself and does not doesn't want anything for the others. This is the majority. They are, there are good people out there. So, this is from Sharia to love for the other what you love for yourself. And by the way, the Sharia com commands the Muslims that they should uh, obey the law, the laws of the land where they live in. And this will clear up a misconception that some people are saying, well, these Muslims are trying to bring Sharia law into America. Mm -hmm. Sharia law would not work in America. Sharia law should be uh, followed in a Muslim country, in a place where the absolute majority is a Muslim because that's their religion, it's, it's a full package. But Sharia also commands the Muslim, wherever they go, to obey the laws where, uh, of the land where, where they live. And this is very important for us to understand. And Muslims in America, uh, uh, they're here just like everyone, looking for a better future for themselves and their children. They, uh, uh, many of them are here because they escape religious persecution, just like the very founders of this country. They want to enjoy the same freedoms and be a part of a civilized society. And most importantly, uh, they want to have the freedom to worship as they see fit, without fear of oppression, victimization, mistreatment, abuse, discrimination, or tyranny. Because more often than not, it is the reason that they left their old homes and they left their old countries in the first place. They want to practice their religion without uh, fear of being ostracized because of the foolishness of some groups of people. You know those. We've heard, we've heard of them in the media. All of them. All of us all heard of them. They claim to be Muslims. They commit horrendous criminal acts, and they claim that it is part of this religion. That is uh, uh, the the very essence of their religion is innocent uh, of them and what they do. Which brings us to another word that I guess most of you are waiting to hear the explanation of. And the word is, who can tell me? Jihad. Jihad. Yes. There you go. You're waiting for that one. And it's actually in Arabic, jihad. Jihad. Now, most of the time you will hear that the, the so-called expert that they bring on TV, uh, I call them the Hollywood experts, you know. They, they bring drama itself. It, it brings ratings. You know. they, when they say jihad, what, how do they translate? Who can tell me? How do they Holy translate it? The Holy War. Yes. But if you tell anyone, here, we can do an experiment right now. I have it written in front of me, the explanation of Holy War. 
There's a, bro there's a brother right there that speaks Arabic. If I told you to translate holy war into the Arabic language, what would you tell me? Holy war? Yeah. Word by word. Word by word. Holy uh -huh. is... Uh, Hadith. Uh -huh. War is, is Harb. So if you translate holy war, it gives you Al Harbu Al Muqaddasa. Does it sound like jihad? Does it sound like jihad? <laughs> Al Harbu Al Muqaddasa. That's holy war. So that translation and explanation is, is wrong uh, completely, unfortunately. Uh, but the real meaning of jihad, uh, uh, it, is, it means striving and struggling. Striving and struggling. In order to live the life of a righteous believer, one has to, and one that, that fears his creator, and the one that loves his creator as well, you have to strive and struggle. It's not easy. It is not easy to live a righteous life. It requires what? Effort, which is a struggle or to, to, to struggle and to strive. Which makes jihad actually a very noble behavior that all of you, I'm sure, do. All of you do jihad against your own selves because you want to be good, you want to be righteous, you want to be charitable, you want to help people, right? That's your own jihad. Does that make you bad? No, it's, it's a noble behavior. To, it's a noble behavior to have. So, uh, the jihad, the, the struggle that we have to, uh, to do in, in the course of our lives, there, there, there are many. There are many fronts. You have to struggle against the things that prevent you from being good, a good person and a good worshiper. You have to struggle against the sides of your character, the flaws that you have that prevent you from being generous and giving and forgiving and patient because all of these positive manners and behaviors, they require from a person what? Jihad. They require from us jihad to struggle against ourselves and to struggle against, against the element a lot of times. Also, part of jihad, for example, is to be able to defend your family and, and defend yourself. Example, someone breaks into your home, what are you supposed to do? Is to sit there and tell them, okay, take whatever you want and take me with it? No. You say, someone breaks into your home, you have to, it's your duty to protect yourself and your family. That is also a form of jihad. And subhanAllah, it is an important part of sharia that I mentioned earlier, that we do, all of us do jihad, strive and struggle to preserve human life. It is part of jihad and also part of sharia to preserve and protect human life. A quote from the Quran, uh, the Almighty said, I am, I'm sure you've heard that one before because it, they even quoted that in movies, that whoever preserves, a, uh, whoever takes a life unjustly without just cause, it is in the Quran he said that, it is as if he has taken the life of all of mankind. And whoever helps preserve a life, it is as he, if he, pres he helps preserve all of mankind. This is what Islam calls to. But what jihad is not, it is not committing acts of violence. It is not declaring war against other religions. It is not spilling the blood of innocent people. It is not destroying people's property. It is not committing suicide. It is not harming people in any way, shape, or form. It is not putting fear in people's hearts. Uh, it reminds me of a, another hadith, the saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He said, that if you sneak, you sneak behind someone who's a friend of yours to startle him and prank him, that is a sin in our religion. Because you have, what's the first reaction? It's fear, right? You get startled. Some people, you know, that, that are, you know, uh, have weak hearts, they, it could, could be fatal for them. Our Prophet made that forbidden, made it, he made it a sin in our religion. And it is not from jihad to, dis to disturb and disrupt people's lives in any way, shape, or form, or forcing anyone into any religion, religious beliefs and system. And this one, really, I'm going to be honest with you. When I hear that in the news, it really baffles me. They are, you know, this religion, it's by the sword. By the way, you look all through the Quran, you will not find the word sword, not even once. It does not exist in the Quran. Yeah, I'll take that challenge and read the Quran. You will not find the word sword at all. It baffles me because religion is a connection and a relationship between you and your creator. And if you're not sincere in your belief, if you're not sincere in your religion, then what does it, what good does it do? Nothing. It serves no purpose because it is a connection. So 
Can you possibly force someone to believe truly from their hearts? It's impossible. That's why Allah in the Quran said, لا إكراه في الدين There is no compulsion in their religion. You cannot possibly force anyone to believe anything. And that's why if you read history, and true history, not his story, <laughs> history, you will find that under uh, Islamic reign, wherever it was, when there were truly people that follow Islam, you'll find that Jews and Christians and atheists and fire worshippers, they were allowed to worship as they see fit. Their churches and synagogues and, and uh, temples were never harmed in any way, shape or form. And he's, it is uh, someone who does something like that, he, will, he was held accountable by the law. And he was also, he's also going to be held accountable on the day of, of judgment because of what he did. It's called what, what they call Al-Mu'ahad. Al-Mu'ahad is the one that uh, in, 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 in uh, Islamic jurisprudence, you'll find this word in Mu'ahad, and there are books of that, and encyclopedias been written about this word in Mu'ahad. What it means is when someone who's not Muslim is living in a, in a Muslim country, or vice versa, who, someone who's Muslim living in a non-Muslim country. The Mu'ahad is, is, is this, I'll, I'll try to put it, put it in layman terms. When you go into, when a non-Muslim comes to a Muslim country, he is granted entry to the country, right? Goes through the customs, the, 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 the normal way, the visa, whatever. <coughs> that, that procedure right there, that, uh, 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 the fact that he's given entry, process. That, that process, yes, I'm looking for it. I just translated with, used French to translate that word. <laughs> <laughs> Him and I speak French all the time yeah. to each other. So uh, uh, that process, basically, not a procedure, we're not in a, sur in a surgery here, no, we're not in a doctor. <laughs> the process is, uh, it, what does it entail? What does it say? It says that this person, the minute he enters our home, our country, he is not to be harmed in his person, physically, in his honor, and in his wealth or possession. And anyone who breached this particular contract will be held accountable. Even more than that. Uh, do you know who are the, the people who will get, receive the worst punishment uh, on the Day of Judgment? Among those people are the ones that come on the Day of Reckoning as the enemies of a prophet or a messenger. Imagine someone comes on the Day of Reckoning and he's the enemy of Jesus. Did Jesus has, have enemies? He did. Imagine what the, how those people would be. The, uh, he's the, oh, look, that's the enemy of Jesus. So the enemy of any prophet or messenger He's in big trouble on the Day of Judgment. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, whoever harms Al-Mu'ahad, now you know what that word means, right? Al-Mu'ahad, in any way, shape, or form, in his person, in his honor, in his property, even takes something from him, with, and it's not with, from his uh, free will, I am the one who will be his enemy on the Day of Reckoning, on the Day of Judgment, I will be his enemy. Does, I don't care if he's a Muslim or not, does, does not matter. So, and what one to what one to someone who will come to to God on the day of judgment and have any one of the prophets and messengers be his enemy? And this is the case of the ones that reach that uh, mu'ahada. And similarly, when a, a Muslim comes to a non-Muslim land, just like our great country here, America, then the mu'ahada visa, whatever he's given in it, whether it's written or not, he has to understand that they are giving him permission to live here and enjoy all the things that people have here, all the freedoms and everything. But in return, he has to behave himself. He has to follow the laws, follow the rules and regulations. If he does not that, he does not do that, he's a sinner and he's a breach in breach of al mu'ahada, which al mu'ahada also can mean a contract, a covenant. And this is very, very important in Islam because the Prophet mentioned the ones that break their covenants as the hypocrites. And the hypocrites will have the worst punishment uh, in the hellfire, you know, according to uh, Islamic uh, scriptures. So I hope that clarifies that. So uh, uh, all the things that I mentioned that are not from jihad, all the negative things, uh, uh, they are actually the opposite, the opposite of of the real meaning of jihad. Which brings me to uh, uh, the main reason that I'm why I'm here today, the question that is on everyone's mind today. Why is it that every time we hear of acts of violence, <coughs> terrorism, and most of the time it is all, always the name of a, of a Muslim or someone that is associated with Islam 
is always a, that's on on the screen, it's on the TV, on the news. We live in very confusing times, uh, full of trials and tribulations for all of us. Uh, a time where things are not as they appear. The the truth the truth has which used to be a very simple thing, a straightforward thing, is not anymore. It is it has become a rare commodity, uh, 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 and the world is full of deception. It is today. It is all. Uh, about the bottom line. I think you guys understand where I'm going. I'm not, not going to go any further, uh, you know, out of respect for a lot of things. But I, I will. I could sit here and tell you that I know what goes behind the scenes, but I don't. It is the Almighty. He's the only one that knows the unseen. But what I do know, what I do know, is that those evil groups, just like ISIS, that claim to be Muslims, are either a completely misguided. Or B, they're just absolute liars. It's one or the other. Because this evil group and any group that has the same mentality and behavior, and they're, uh, they, are, they, are more, they are responsible for more fatalities from the Muslims themselves more than any other group. We have to understand that. These are people that preach hate and propagate violence and tyranny, while Islam preaches the opposite of that. Anyone that picks up a a book that really explains Islam and reads the Quran and, and understands it, it preaches love and tolerance, and patience, and mercy and compassion. And these are the attributes because in Islam, the Almighty, the creator of the, of the heavens and the earth has 99 names and attributes. And all the ones that I mentioned are from them. So I, and I say this a lot in my lectures in our mosque, that it is important for us to try to mimic in our limited capacity of mortals to mimic these attribute is lofty attributes that our Creator has which is patience and tolerance and mercy compassion and love all of those and uh, these groups like ISIS and I hate to mention their names uh, they are the enemies of all that they are the enemies of all Muslims before being the enemies of humanity as Muslims uh, we are supposed to we also are supposed to fight against them not only not just the rest the rest of the world we are supposed to be their enemies, because uh, uh, if you look at what the scholars of Islam are saying, they're denouncing these people in the strongest language. Uh, 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 and if Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was here today, he will seize these people and he will deal with them the way that they ought to be dealt with, since they are again they go against everything that he stood for. They uh, do the opposite of what he taught, and on top of it, they claim to follow him. They, cl they claim to be his followers while well, he's innocent of them, and he's innocent of what they do. Oh, well, there are many stories that come to mind when it comes to the biography of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that shows his mercy, compassion, uh, but I will, uh, and even with, with his own enemies, how, he, how merciful he was and compassionate. Uh, you have to understand that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was received revelation after he lived with his people for 40 years. And they used to call him as sadiq al-Amin. What does that mean? Sadaq, the most trustworthy. The, the, the truthful and the trustworthy. trustworthy. The truthful and the trustworthy. Forty years. But they also knew that he was illiterate. They didn't know how to write or read. And these people had complete command of what? What did I mention earlier? Language. The language. They're poets. They understood good good speech from, <coughs> from regular speech. So he came to them with the revelation that was given to him you know, from, from the Almighty to the angel Gabriel. And he was these words that were so eloquent, and anyone who studies languages will tell you, the most eloquent speech in the Arabic language is the Quran, without a doubt. This eloquent speech from a man who's we know to be illiterate for 40 years, how is that possible? But they knew that by what he was, the message that he was trying to deliver, he's going to change all their way of life. They were the ones, the leaders of the sacred house, that was the very first sacred house of worship. They were the leaders of it, and they made that brought them a lot of money, they brought them a lot of power. But they were pagans, they worshipped idols, and he was there too, to teach them, to teach them what? Monotheism, to worship one Lord, one creator. They didn't want, the, they didn't want to have any part of it. So immediately, he, was, he became, he, he went from a uh, uh, number one uh, uh, citizen of Mecca uh, for 40 years, in one day, in one minute, to the to number the one the, the most wanted one let's say in Mecca they became his enemies 
And he struggled with them for 13 years before he had to move out. Now, the story that I'm going to tell you is a, about a trip that he took. He felt that calling these people to the truth, it, you know, the scene is, has become saturated. So he decided to go to another city called the Taif, 60 miles, about 70 miles, let's say, roughly, from Mecca. Walking, he walked to it in the desert. Imagine this. He got there, and he stayed there for about 20 days or more. He did not leave one house, did not leave one store, except that he knocked on the door and he told them, I'm here to tell you about the one that created you. You have to worship him, you know, giving, giving them the message. And every time he's, he's mocked, he's insulted, he's pushed, some of them spit, uh, they spit on his face. And at the end of the day, at, at the end of the day, when they got really tired of him, they asked their servants and their children to start throwing rocks on him. So they ran him out of town. Now imagine someone ran you out of town after being there for 20 days trying to teach them. You're bleeding. Because you want what's good for them. You want their salvation. Your feet are bleeding. And your adrenaline is pumping through your veins. And then you get, what do you, you get? Gabriel appears to you, the angel, peace be upon him. Along with the angel, because there's an angel, we've been taught that there's an angel that is in charge of the mountains. The angel of the mountain. And Ta'if happened to be between two mountains. So, uh, the angel of mountains says, Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad, the Almighty greets you and says, He puts me under your control. Order me whatever you want. If you want me to use the two mountains to squeeze all of them with their town, I will do so right now. Now, I just want us to visualize this and put ourselves in his foot, in his shoes, for a minute. Adrenaline, you're, you're hurting, you're bleeding, these people hurt you. The normal reaction for most people say, yes, mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, even more so, put me center stage, I want to be able to see it happen. Clearly. <laughs> but what did he say? Ya Malak al-Jibal, O angel of the mountains, please do not, because I'm still hoping that one day from their loins will come a people that worship the Almighty alone without taking any partners with him. Such is the way of our Prophet Muhammad. And it is the way of the, the prophets and messengers before him. This is very do well documented in the mercy of Jesus, peace be upon him, and Moses, and Abraham, and Noah, and David, and all the other prophets and messengers that we believe in and we, we love, they all had that mercy. Because, uh, and this is in our literature, in, in Islamic li literature, the Almighty has chosen 124 people, 124 men, uh, to be prophets and messengers to send them to Mecca. And he looked at the hearts of the, all the sons of Adam, and he chose the ones with the purest hearts, the ones with the best hearts, the ones with the most mercy and compassion, the ones with the most patience. In patience, look at Noah, 950 years, <laughs> calling these people away from paganism. <laughs> That's patience. And it was said that his ark, the, the maximum number that I, that I heard is 80 people. Look at this ratio. This kind of ratio in any business, you fail. This business here is bankrupt. 950 years to call 80 people? But was he, was he not a success story? Absolutely, he was a success story because he delivered. He did what he, had, he could do. Because we have to understand that the real guidance of the heart is not from people. It is from who? From the, uh, the Almighty, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. People, what do they do? They deliver the message. We give you the message of guidance, but you have to understand that the real, true guidance, the guidance of the heart, is from the Almighty Allah because He's the one that controls the heart. And Noah and all the other prophets, they understood that concept, which made them what? Push through and persevere from beginning to end without worrying about the results because they knew the results were <coughs> in the hands of the Almighty. I don't want to make it way too long. I think we yeah. kind of get the point a little bit. I don't want to go into the details about Islam, the pillars. Most of you have a pretty good idea, but I want to clarify certain things. Uh, hopefully that I'm hoping that they're clear, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, thank you so much for the pleasure. Uh, give me the pleasure and the honor of being amongst you and to, uh, to give me the opportunity to speak uh, in front of you about uh, uh, my religion and, and uh, the way of life that I love so much. Uh, uh, and in the word of uh, all men of God all throughout uh, history, especially from Semitic descent and uh, especially from our beloved Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, he commanded his followers to offer the greeting of Peace, right? And he said, either Shalom Aleikum 
or Shalem Aleikum. In Arabic, we say Assalamu Alaikum. See how similar they are? So, greeting of peace to all of you. Thank you so much for being so attentive, and you have yourself a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you.